Good morning. Welcome to Sunday School. Boy, this is hot. Yeah, that's good. I like it hot. And them that don't, we don't like them. So, welcome to Sunday School, those of you that are here physically and those that are joining us uh, via the internet. God is good. And all the time. And sometimes, you're driving down the road, and the ring of fire occurs, and you find yourself without the special glasses. And one of the guys you're riding with says, I got two pair. Oh, Hallelujah. How many of you saw the ring of fire? It's pretty outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, and it never got there where I was. I was about 30 miles this side of Mason at... 1149. Actually, no, we was with a bunch of guys and we were riding. So, uh, but it was uh, it was neat. It was neat to see. Uh, we were pulled over on the side of the road, and about a hundred yards up the road, uh, three or four cars had pulled over. There's a uh, hysterical marker out there. Uh, I'm sure it was a hysterical marker because when the Eclipse was at its zenith. They all started cackling. I thought there was chickens down there. Uh, and I realized they were at the hysterical marker. So they were being hysterical. But uh, that was interesting. God was displaying his glory in the sky. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes you just don't want to look up. Well, <clears throat> we were in Mason, and there's a little museum in Mason, and the guy there gave one of the guys that I was riding with uh, three or four pairs of those glasses. And uh, they pulled over. I didn't know what was going on. They pulled over, and they said, oh, it's the eclipse, the, the annular eclipse. And I said, well, I can't look at it. I only got one eye. <laughs> and they said, no, here, use these glasses. So uh, It was neat. God is good. Yes. All the time, God is good. Yes. And sometimes when you don't have glasses, you find out that He's God wise. is always <laughs> faithful. Amen? Amen? He is faithful. Well, we've been looking at the subject of prayer, and uh, <clears throat> that's a... That's something that I, I believe the devil works overtime to keep us from doing. Yep. He doesn't want you praying. <laughs> he doesn't want you to understand the authority or the power that's available to us as children of God. Right. So, <clears throat> and he gives us 
lots of interruptions. Lots of, lots of interruptions. Uh, how many of you are reading the uh, Praying Like Monks work? Woo. Yeah. That'll rock your world. <coughs> it's, uh, it's one of those things that will. It'll rock your world. Uh, we found out that uh, praying is a little more difficult than it sounds. It's tough. You ever start to pray and all these things start running through your mind? A train with no caboose. It just goes on and on and on. And you realize after you've looked at 67 cars that None of this has anything to do with what you had sat down to do as far as prayer. A wise man once said, uh, how long do you need to pray? And he said, pray until you pray. Pray until you pray. Hmm. Pray until you can start to shut out all that other stuff and really get down and really start to pray. Uh, and that has to be intentional on our part, doesn't it? We have to set a aside a time to pray. Uh, we have to identify the things that keep us from praying and get rid of them, confront them. We have to trust that God's going to answer our prayer. We have to have confidence. We have to believe who God is and what he says about us, don't we? We have to find comfort in stillness. Ooh. You know, when nothing is happening in church and pastors call for a moment of silence, people, <laughs> they start looking at them. <laughs> How long are we going to be quiet? There's a story about William Penn. Some of you may have heard it. He had a friend that was visiting him, and it was time for, William Penn was a Quaker, and it was time for a prayer service. And this friend had showed up, and he said, well, he said, you're just in time. He said, we have a prayer service at our church. And he said, uh, if you'll accompany me, uh, after we conclude that, we can take care of our business. And the guy said, sure. Now, he was not a Quaker. So they went to this church, and the guy kind of looked around. There's very little trappings in their churches. Or, uh, <coughs> you know, they didn't have a overhead projector or uh, a multimedia set up or uh, microphone or speakers. And, uh, nobody had on any special garb or clothes. And uh, They went in, and there were several people that were there, and they were on their knees and some of them were at the altar they went in and sat down and Penn got on his knees and the guy got next to him and was on his knees and Penn put his head down and this guy's looking around and after about 15 minutes he's wondering what's going to happen here so finally he leans over and he says to Penn he goes when does the service start? And Penn said, when we get off our knees. <laughs> wow. When we get off our knees, that's when the service starts. Hallelujah. Being still. Chapter 2 is called Be Still and Know. And it talks about our prayer posture. Uh, what's your posture in prayer? What do you do to prepare to pray? You sit down and start to beat off all those things that run into your head? Most of us do. Sometimes. I know I have to.
having someone to show you uh, is very important. I learned to pray by watching prayers and listening to prayers, people that really prayed. Uh, at first I started to imitate them, then I realized I was just imitating them. <coughs> but if you keep that up, what you're going to find is you're going to find your own dimension. And you're not going to be imitating, but you're going to be entering in. And that's a process that, uh, that matures in you as you learn to pray and spend time with God. <clears throat> and spending time with God is important. Matter of fact, I think Jesus, maybe it was him that said that. He said, maybe, I didn't say maybe. He said, without me, you can do nothing. So we need him. So when we start to pray, what are we going to do? Start to work our list? I guarantee you every one of us started out praying by praying the problem. We still do. It depends on the day and the time and the hour. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, you have to pick a problem, right? <clears throat> should we be praying the problem or should we be praying the answer? Because what is prayer? I think in its purest form, Prayer is beginning to perceive reality through God's eyes instead of ours. Come on, that, say that again loud. Prayer is perceiving reality through God's eyes and not ours. We tend to look at things the way we look at them. Oh my God, that's a mess. That's why we come to them in the first place. It's because we've got our eyes open. I'm glad some of the people that pray that way weren't looking at me in 1986. Oh my God. <laughs> because I would have been most, voted most likely to fail. I didn't have anything redeeming about me. But not everybody that was praying was praying that for me, thank goodness. Hallelujah. Perceiving reality through God's eyes. Now, if I'm perceiving reality, if you're perceiving reality through God's eyes, what's possible? Oh, All things are possible. Even those things that through our natural eyes look hopeless. Especially those. I think God likes finding hopeless situations. I couldn't have been any more hopeless. I couldn't have been any more helpless. And I was totally incapable of raising myself up. I tried. This is true. This is true. And the best place to experience the presence of God is in prayer. In prayer. I'm not going to preach my message this morning in Sunday school, but we'll get we'll get to that in a little while. Uh Prayer is the closest we can get to heaven. We're in the presence of God. When we begin to trust Him, when we begin to perceive reality through His eyes and not ours, when we begin to make declarations based on His word, But again, it's tough to get there. We live in a world that does not lend itself to quiet. Matter of fact, if you're reading the book, he, he talked about something that's called hurry sickness. Ooh. We can talk about that all day. Let's get to that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Hurry sickness. I'm going to do that. As soon as I do this and that and this and that. And I've got to go over here. And we get so busy being busy that we begin to compartmentalize in smaller and smaller increments the things that are really important to us. And there's nothing more important to the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century, in the day that we live in today, than to learn how to pray and pray effectively. Maybe I am going to preach, I don't know. <laughs> to spend time with him, quality time with him. And the devil fights against that. He gives us all these distractions. Cell phones. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> if, if, television. All of you that are looking at your phones, I'm not talking to you because I know you're looking at the Word. <coughs> I think that was selfish. Yes, it was. <laughs> In the book it says there are three things that are historically abnormal but universally accepted in the Western lifestyle. The clock... I'll just read what it says. In 1370, the first public clock was set up in Germany. Historians popularly point to that moment as the turning point when the world shifted from natural time to artificial time. P previously, people awoke with the sun's rising and went to bed with its setting. There was a rhythm to life, longer days in the summer, shorter days in the winter, which is, he says, he assumes how people made it through the German winters before central heat because they mostly just slept through it. As of 1370, when people started managing their time artificially, time shifted from being a limit governing our lives to a resource used according to our individual agendas. We've never experienced yeah. <clears throat> when people started managing their time artificially, time shifted from being a limit governing our lives to a resource used according to our individual agendas. We started to use time, but we used it incorrectly. As a matter of fact, we used it for commerce. The second invention was the light bulb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In 1879, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, which, among other things, cut way back on our sleep time. Prior to the light bulb, the average American slept 10 hours a night. <laughs> How many of you slept 10 hours last night? How many of you slept 10 hours ever? Yeah, me too. <laughs> By 1960, central air conditioning and heating, microwaves, dishwashers, and laundry machines were common in American homes. Around that time, sociologists commonly started making predictions about what human life would look like by this time, the time that you and I are living in right now, and pretty much everyone was on the same page. There was a dramatic increase in leisure and ease of life. A Senate subcommittee in 1967 jointly predicted that by 1985, the average American would work 22 hours a week for 27 weeks a year because of all the leisure time this new technology was going to free up. In reality... <clears throat> the average time people spend on leisure has decreased since the 1980s. Technology has continued to advance and save us time. They got that part right. What they misjudged was how we'd use it. 
we spend time on things other than deep rest. We're not using our time wisely. It's okay. It's allowed here. Deep rest. There's some people that have never experienced deep rest. Yeah. Never shuts up. Never shuts off. You go to bed and it's going, and you wake up and it's going, yeah. And last but not least, he says iPhone. I guess it could be any phone. Just the iPhone? You sure about that? When Apple re released the first iPhone in June 2007, they gave us a tracking device for that very data. A 2016 study found that the average iPhone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. Staring at their phone screens for two and a half hours over 76 sessions. A more recent 2019 study di discovered that in just three years, that figure has more than doubled to over five hours a day. So instead of slowing down and harnessing technology to free up leisure time, we now suffer from what mental health professionals call hurry sickness, a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiety in a society that prizes efficiency and productivity above all else, that that use time, that uses time like a tool rather than a limit, hurry isn't an occasional necessity, it's the new normal. Be still. It's not as simple as it sounds because we have these distractions. And some people say, well, in this society that we live in, it's impossible to get there. No, it's not. But you have to be intentional. And the, and the culture we live in looks down on people who waste time. Yeah, well, what they call wasted time is not what God calls wasted time. How much time in the presence of God is wasted? How many times have you sat down to pray or sat down to read your Bible or sat down to have a devotion and something came up that's demanding your attention somewhere else and you say, well, I'll do that later? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because the devil still do, does what he came to do, steal, kill, and destroy. One of the things he wants to steal is your leisure time. And he really doesn't, really wants to steal that time when you intend to spend it with God. If he can get you off the track, he'll take you. So we've got a lot of distractions that's built into our 21st century uh, way of life, especially here in the West. But I think it'd be very beneficial for us to learn to do without some of that stuff, to set a time, a, sp a special time. Uh, you know, there's a, a sign up there that says, turn off your cell phone during the service. I think that's really important. The kids at school have their phones all the time. Oh, it's, it's b worse than that. I have a friend that, that is a substitute teacher. Most of those kids have two, t two phones because they know the teacher's going to take the first one. No, no. He said almost every one of them's got two phones. Well, <coughs> yeah. What are you going to do with that? Do we need an overhaul? Well, yeah. Well, schools aren't very good at following through on the rules that they do make. That's true. parents get upset. Yeah. I saw a meme the other day, and it's so appropriate. It said, Junior at school in the 1970s, and mom and dad are standing there with Junior 
in front of the teacher and they're saying to Junior, how come you got an F of this subject? And then it's 2023 and the parents are standing there with Junior and he's got a big grin on his face and they're yelling at the teacher, how come Junior got an F in this subject? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's, a, there's some basic things that need to happen. Uh, we need to get back. Like Jesus coming back. Jesus coming back will be a big one. Uh, <clears throat> but in the meantime, what are we going to do? We've got kids that graduate from school, don't know how to read, don't know how to write, can't make change. There's an any kid that's graduated, graduated in the last 20 years that knows how to make change. That's because you taught them. Except that we homeschooled. Actually, yeah, we homeschooled. <laughs> yeah. But most of the kids out there, hey, if the cash register breaks or the power goes down, they don't know how to pull out a pencil and do math, simple math. They don't even know the value of a quarter. They yeah. can't figure it out. They don't yeah. Know. What? No. We're using tape measures. Well, they, they sent their kids to school. School's supposed to take care of that. Whether yeah. they like us or not, that's on them. Yeah. We're here to be the parent, whether they're yeah. 50 or 90 or <coughs> Well, the assault against the family has a source. Mm -hmm. And we have to go to the source when we, look, when we talk about these things. <coughs> Why is the nuclear family being disintegrated? It's because we have an adversary. His name is Satan. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's good at it. And, and the, the they're trying to take the authority away from the parent now. Yes. Well, the and parents relinquish their authority today. And give it to the government. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Years ago, I had a, Jimmy was a special needs child, and uh, occasionally you had to go to school for what they call an ADR meeting, admission, uh, dismissal, or review. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I tried to go to every one of those and did. And probably the fourth or fifth one I went to, the teacher said, Mr. Mitchell, gosh, we appreciate you coming in. And she seemed really overly grateful. And I didn't know that I was doing anything different. And I said, well, isn't it my duty to be here? This is my son. And she goes, most of the time it's just us and the child. Uh, she said, we very seldom ever see any parents at these ADR meetings. And she said, it really excites us when we see one. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, <laughs> how sad. I give you my kid, you do what you want with him, just keep him out of my hair for eight hours. Mm -hmm. well, and then everything that goes wrong with it is your fault. fault. That's right. I sent him to you, why didn't you get it straight? Uh, and hey it's the same thing in churches there's a lot of people will send their kids to church wise parents take their children to church the don't send them is, though, is the only way to change it is to change one thing you've earned it you have it you don't earn it you don't get it yeah you win the race you won not here your trophy because you came in last <laughs> That's participation, the participation, yeah. Well, uh, those are very deep issues, but they all have a common initiator. Mm -hmm. The fact that people don't realize their own responsibilities and don't follow through on them. And the reason for that is because they don't know who God is. Yep. I believe that when God is who he's supposed to be, the rest of your life will line up. And if society in general looks like it's out of control, it's because they're out of God. Maybe that's just me being simplistic, but I don't think so. I think God brings the balance. That's right. But it's only by the grace of God that we are where we are, and that's 
that's what we have to remember. I mean, I know not everybody in here has, you know, a crazy life like like Mike and I did. But you know, when I know when I was in the world, I didn't I didn't care. Yeah. I didn't care. You know, and that's what we have to remember when we see people. They they don't care. Well. Unless they know Jesus, they're not going to. Jesus is a pretty smart guy. And he said some pretty smart things that we would do well to heed. How are people going to know who you are? You going to show them your church membership card? Are you? Are you? But if you're a minister, you can pull out your minister's card and really impress them. Yeah. John remembers the <laughs> Does the world need your judgment? Does it need your conviction? Do the people that know, that don't know Jesus Christ need anything from you except what he said for you to give them? By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. Love for one another. Historically, we've been pretty poor at that. Are you saved? Okay, we can have fellowship. I, I sure like the fact that you're saved. You're my kind of guy, and I'm your kind of, and we're, we're both God's kind of guy. You're vending, yeah. Or, <clears throat> are you saved? No, I don't believe in God. Well, I can't have anything to do with you. And that's so prevalent in the world that we live in. There's lots of people out there that don't believe in God because the only God they've ever seen is you. And there's not enough God in you to show them anything that looks like God. I'm not talking subjectively to anybody. I'm just speaking in general. The church has done a very poor job of emulating or, or following through on what Jesus told us to do. And I believe that if we start to do that, we'll see a difference. From the very beginning, what did Jesus say? <laughs> They took note of them that they had been with Jesus. Do people know that you've been with Jesus? Can they tell by your lifestyle? Can they tell by the way that you conduct yourself, by the way that you talk? Maybe by the way that you don't talk. Makes a difference. There's lots of people out there, and we have the opportunity to witness to everyone that God puts in our path. We're going to witness to his glory or we're going to witness to our shame. That's the choice. Mm. What's going to get you there? What's going to keep you there? I'll tell you what's going to get you there and keep you there. Prayer. Learning to spend time with God, to talk to God and, and to r arrive at that place where you can shut down your mouth and shut down your brain and let him talk to you. Because he's got something to say. He's got wisdom to impart. John Dean, almost every time we come together, he'll ask one question. What's God been saying to you? You know why? Because he expects that God said something to you and he, and he knows that you should have been sharp enough to listen to him. What's God been saying to you? Do you know that you can ask yourself that? What's God been saying to me? And what's your answer? 
Well, I don't know. I saw a meme the other day. This guy said, oh, I wish God would say something to me. And somebody said, read your Bible. He said, no. <laughs> well, I, I wish I could just hear him. and said, read it out loud. <laughs> read it out loud. God is speaking to us through his word. That's one of the ways that God can speak to you. When you're quiet, <coughs> he can say things to us. And most of us are so busy or there's so many things running through our head that we can't hear him and that's what we have to come against because he wants to talk to us. He wants to share with us. He wants to enrich you spirit, soul, and body. And we have to give him the opportunity. The world set us up so we can be cut off from that most of the time and not even think about it. But that's the world. I'm not here to inherit the world. I've been placed here by God Almighty to <laughs> inherit his kingdom. And so have you. And that's what I want. That's what you want. To walk on streets of gold. That's not pie in the sky. That's what the word says. To glory in his presence. To worship with the angels. Can you imagine what it's going to sound like? Whew. Well, there you go. See, how, how near is your Jesus? Is he on a hill far away? Is he up in heaven? Or is he a very present help in time of need? Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, I'll come and live with you. My Father and I will come and live in you. We'll make our, we will tabernacle with you. And I'm glad he said tabernacle. Because it's temporary. <laughs> he also said, I prepare a place for you and I'll come and receive you unto myself so that where I am you may be also. He's not tabernacling then. He's taking us home. <laughs> Glory. Ooh. I'm thinking of the song we were singing the other night, Is He Worthy? Is He Worthy? Yes, He is. So. Coming into the presence of God, learning to be quiet, getting beyond this hurry sickness, learning to see reality from God's point of view instead of ours. and realizing that we're not here forever. Some people never, ever look past the surface of their own mortality. But it's past that. It's through that. It's when you get on the other side that you find out who you really are. I'm a child of God. You're a child. Recreated in his image. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Hallelujah. Prayer helps us to realize who we really are. And it's really important for us to know that, isn't it? Well, Father, we bless you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that your hand is upon us. We thank you, Lord, that deep calls unto deep, that you have sent out the call to each and every one of our hearts and spirits to come and spend time with you. You relish the time that you spend with us, and, and Lord, help us to relish the time that we spend with you. 
We bless you this morning. Help us to stay on the track that you put us on. You, you put us on a, on a different track. We don't know exactly where it's going to take us, but we know that you're going to lead us every step of the way. And for that, we're truly thankful and truly grateful. Bless us as we pray. Your disciples said to you, Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. We echo that question in our own hearts. Lord, teach us to pray. Pull us into deeper avenues of prayer with you. Bring us into your presence. Help us to keep the distractions behind us. Help us to view reality through your eyes. And we'll be so careful to thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Mm-hmm.